Good morning, Yelm students. We are excited to host the Professionals by Pathway Career Exploration event to help students connect their learning to career opportunities. I'm Alex McIntyre. I'm excited to welcome uh, Kaylin Cecil Wevida, a super, I'm sorry, a senior deputy prosecuting attorney as our guest today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for Before, having me. Yeah, of course. Before we get started, I want to remind everybody this is being recorded so future students can benefit from our speakers. We have the next 30 minutes to learn about this career field, the education that is needed to enter and grow within the industry, and what advice our speaker has for our students. We will be monitoring any questions that students submit. Let's get started so our students can learn about various professions and how they can prepare for the future. Kaylin, tell us about your career field. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, tell us about your career field, like how to get started, growth opportunities, pay, and more. I will do that. Uh, first of all, go ahead and interrupt and ask questions anytime. I do have some time at the end for questions and answers. I notice students usually think up quite a few things they want to ask me by the time I'm done speaking, but you can interrupt me at any time. Um, so yeah, my name is Kaylin Cecil Wibara. I actually am a Yelm High School graduate, 1994. I've been an attorney for 18 years and I've been a prosecutor for about 13 years. I worked in Lewis County first and I've been in Thurston County since 2010. My kids are Yelm High School students as well. My son Coulter graduated last year and my daughter Ansley is a sophomore. So today we're gonna start um, by uh, covering a few topics. The first thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is what is a prosecutor? What is the role of the prosecutor in the criminal justice system? I'm gonna do a virtual tour of my office as well as I can. I'm actually working from home right now. We're gonna talk about how do you become a prosecutor? And then as I promised, we'll have that time for you to ask me those questions that you don't have for me while I'm speaking. So what is a prosecutor? Um, a prosecutor is a licensed attorney or lawyer. The word attorney and lawyer mean the same thing. We represent the state um, or a city. We actually have city prosecutors in our state as well. Um, we don't represent individual people. I'm actually prohibited by law from representing individuals. Um, I also cannot practice other kinds of law. So, um, a criminal prosecutor tends to be highly specialized in criminal law, and you wouldn't want them to practice any sort of other law anyway. Um, it'd be kind of like going to a foot doctor to have your heart looked at. Um, we enforce criminal law, and in other states we're called a district attorney or a DA. And the reason in, is that in other states, some of the other states have um, counties that are so small that they can't support a prosecutor's office. So counties will form a district and have one person represent the entire district. And we don't have that situation in Washington. So we are called prosecutors, not district attorneys. So I'm gonna play you a video, um, which is put out by the National District Attorneys Association. And it describes some things that prosecutors do in today's time. There's been a lot of attention on district attorneys lately and the prosecutor's role in the criminal justice system. But you might not know all the things the DA does, the limits on the DA's power, and the ways the DAs have already been changing their approach to prosecution in recent years. The DA's number one responsibility is keeping our community safe. We do that in three basic ways that we call the three P's. Prosecute criminals who break the law, work to prevent crimes from happening in the first place, and protect and support victims of crime and make sure their voices are heard. When you think of the DA, you probably think prosecutors. While that's a big part of our job, the power we have to hold criminals accountable is carefully defined by the law and our ethical responsibilities. When someone's arrested, we carefully review the facts and the evidence. We can only file the criminal charges we believe we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Our job includes protecting the rights of the innocent, as well as those we charge with a crime. Then, the case moves through the justice system, which provides checks and balances and accountability. Public defenders, criminal defense attorneys, and judges all play a role in how the case will resolve. Prosecutors alone don't determine a person's punishment if they're convicted. 
That's up to a judge and jury once we've proved our case. Our goal is always fair and equal justice for everyone, but also justice that's smart and reflects the needs of our society and the will of the people. As prosecutors, we also have the ability to give people second chances. That's why we work with special courts that steer people away from jail, still hold them accountable, but get them the help they need to break the cycle and stay out of jail. Help like mental health treatment, finding a place to live, or kicking a drug or alcohol addiction. We also support restorative justice programs that help offenders understand the harm that they've caused to a particular victim or community. That's one way we prevent crime, but there are lots of others. We work with youth to help them make good choices and stay in school. We support programs that help people who are coming out of prison to find jobs. And we let the public know how to recognize and report crimes like child abuse, elder abuse, sexual assault, and human trafficking. The third big part of our job is protecting and supporting victims of crime. In a typical year, the DA's office comes into contact with thousands of victims, and we help them in lots of ways. We help get them emotional support for the trauma they suffer from having a child or loved one murdered, or the emotional pain from a violent crime like rape. We help victims even when we can't file charges against the person who hurt them. We sometimes even use therapy dogs to help them testify in court and tell their story. Arf. We do all of this on behalf of you, the people. We embrace reform, but we'll always work to make sure change happens in a way that continues to keep our neighborhoods and you safe. And we're accountable to you and to the laws in every state across the nation. Okay, so that was a little video that describes what we do. And I wanted to share with you a little bit about what the criminal um, justice process is and then talk about what my role is in it. So you saw the video um, and they use this little diagram. And so I tried to replicate it here in my PowerPoint slide so I could share with you what I wanna to talk to you about. So someone commits a crime, let's say um, that's something that our state says that you can go to jail for doing. So in our example might be a DUI, driving under the influence, uh, maybe an assault, a robbery, or a murder. So you person commits that crime, and then law enforcement officers will investigate that crime. A lot of people get confused about whether or not a prosecutor can investigate a crime, and we cannot. We're not law enforcement officers. We don't carry guns. Um, we don't have the ability to arrest people. Um, we do have badges which we use to identify ourselves when we're at crime scenes um, and that my kids used to play with when I was little, when they were little, um, but we cannot investigate crime. And that's really important because people will call us all the time and be really upset. They want to tell us something that happened and we're, we have to be sympathetic, but know where to point them. So crimes have to be reported to law enforcement officers. However, we oftentimes will help law enforcement officers during this investigation phase. And that's one of the more uh, exciting or fun things that we can do. More often than not, what that looks like is helping to assist law enforcement officers with search warrants. So they may call us and talk to us about an investigation that's in progress um, and ask us some questions about how to prepare their search warrant. Um, what are, and maybe uh, get some ideas for what sorts of things they might be looking for as evidence in this particular case. Um, sometimes we respond to crime scenes. So even though I usually work an eight to five job, I get called out in the middle of the night. Sometimes I've been to murder scenes or the scenes of other shootings. I was out about a month ago, uh, walking around the middle of I-5, which was closed down um, in the middle of the night. It was very cold and it was very weird to be walking around on I-5. Um, but that's something that we might get to do. And the reason that we're there, again, is to help the law enforcement officers decide um, what sorts of things they might want to search if they need to get a search warrant right there on the scene. A law enforcement um, might need a prosecutor to help them do that. The other thing is it's really helpful for us to see the crime scene um, in person because later we might have to take this case to trial and explain to jurors what happened. And it's just really helpful if we're there, especially in a murder scene. So you can really see what was going on um, and that will help you paint the picture for the jury when it's time to try the case. 
We have prosecutors that participate in a narcotics task force and they, um, their job is to help investigate and stop major drug dealers. So our prosecutors are embedded with that team. They work in the same office with those law enforcement officers and they often will be there as well to help um, be present when the search warrants are executed on people's houses. The last thing that we kind of do that's exciting is we, <clears throat> excuse me, is we will attend autopsies. And again, that's really helpful if we're going to be trying a murder case um, to be able to talk to the pathologist as they do the examination of the victim's body and help understand what was what was really going on. Do we have a question? We do have a question. I'm not sure if you'll get to this one here in, in the next couple of slides, but it says, what skills or work qualities would you say are most important in your workplace? So in my workplace, you have to be, I always joke around and say, if you don't have ADD, you have to develop it. And I am going to talk about what is a typical day in the, in the um, job of a prosecutor. You really have to be able to jump around from task to task to task and do really wildly different things um, at the turn, you know, drop of a hat. You're just one minute you're doing this, next minute you're doing that. You're constantly getting interrupted, getting phone calls from law enforcement officers. You're running in and out of court. Um, so you need to be able to switch gears like that. You also need to be able to read um, and digest what you're reading and make a decision about it really quickly. So if you don't like to read, you probably would not be um, a very good attorney and you definitely would hate law school because you're gonna be reading cases a lot. So especially on a Monday morning, if I weren't speaking to you right now, I would be reading through all the police reports that came in over the weekend as quickly as I can to make a decision about whether or not we're going to proceed with those cases today. So let me move in, move on to that and talk about um, being a prosecutor. So after law enforcement gets done with their investigation, um, they either arrest the person or they refer the case to the prosecutor. And then we um, try the case. So we start looking at the case. So like I said, the first thing we're going to be doing is reviewing the police report and we're going to decide, is there enough evidence here for me to go forward? Am I able to meet all of the elements of this crime that I have to prove to the court? We're going to talk to victims. You know, what do you want to have happen in this case? What are you thinking about would be a fair way to resolve this? Some people don't want charges to be filed and we want to listen to that. It's ultimately the prosecutor's decision, not the victim's decision, but we do want to talk to the victims about that's so another skill that you'd want to have is people skills. You need to not be too shy and you need to be able to speak to strangers and feel comfortable doing that. That's not something I was comfortable with when I first became an attorney, but I did get used to it. Um, we're going to be deciding, do I plea bargain this case? Am I going to offer a reduced um, crime or sentence? Or do, is this something that I need to go to trial on? Um, we may be preparing a case for trial. We may interview victims. We may um, write some motions or some things to the court about the case. Um, I may be preparing exhibits for a trial and I may be preparing for a sentencing in a trial that I had earlier. And I'm gonna do all these things in one day. So I'm gonna do a little bit of all of these things every day and I'm gonna do it as fast as I can and as competently as I can because my caseload is really high. Um, so in our office, we have 24 prosecutors in our criminal division, and we divide up our prosecutors into teams. So we all, we all practice criminal law, but then we have subspecialties. So we have, let me say one, two, three, four, five criminal teams. We have our juvenile team. They work just with juvenile offenders. We have special victims teams. Those prosecutors work with um, sexual assault victims and also child victims, whether they're child sexual assault victims or child abuse victims. We have our domestic violence team. Those prosecutors work with crimes that are committed um, on, uh, by one intimate partner against another intimate partner. We have a general felony team. That's the team that I supervise. We handle most of the violent crime um, that doesn't fall into those other categories and some of the serious drug offenses. We have a new team called the First Look Team, and that's where we do a lot of those non-traditional things that we talked about in the video that you saw in the video. And I'm gonna talk about those in a few minutes a little bit more closely. We also have a special member of our office named Marshall that I will talk about a little bit later. 
Okay, so here's a little bit of our virtual tour. So here's some prosecutors. On the left is Heather Stone. In the middle, this is Olivia Zell. And this is Detective Chris Johnstone at the Olympia Police Department. Um, this was a photograph that um, we took after these three completed a trial. So the prosecutors were the ones who were presenting the case, but Detective Johnstone was one of their witnesses and he sat with them in court. This was a 10 week long trial. Um, they, they prosecuted a man for leading organized crime and he was convicted of 43 counts of burglary. So that trial took 10 weeks, which is I think a near record in our office. Most of the time our trials take a few days. So this crew worked really hard and most of the time we do not prioritize property crimes because of how many cases we have. We try to focus on crimes of violence. But this case was really interesting because of how many places this guy had been burglarizing. And sometimes property crimes can be really important to victims. You know, these people lost um, jewelry that had been in their family forever, things that had really sentimental value to them. And, and so when you think about 43 different houses that like this um, guy was convicted of burglarizing, that's 43 different families that were impacted by his behavior. And we helped hold him accountable for that. So here is a picture of one of our courtrooms. This is our big courtroom in Superior Court. Superior Court is where we have um, our felony cases. Felony cases are uh, crimes where you're going to serve more than a year in, in jail if you're convicted. So in this case, somebody is getting sentenced. So here's the prosecutor right here. And here's the defendant. She's wearing jail scrubs and that's her attorney. Over here are some other people who are in jail and they're waiting for their hearings to be held. So after trial, um, Heather and Olivia from the last slide, they would come in here maybe a few weeks later and they would present um, what they wanted the sentence to be. And these victims here in the courtroom, they would have the right to come forward and testify and, and ask the court um, for a particular sentence. Um, going to trial and having a sentencing hearing afterwards is kind of what everybody thinks our job is about, but we actually try very few of our cases. I think we try like 3% of the cases that come in. Everything else we resolve um, through plea bargaining or through a, a treatment court, which we're going to talk about in a minute. <clears throat> there is no way that our criminal justice system could have trials for every single case. So oftentimes when you hear that charges got reduced, it's not because the prosecutor thought it was a bad case or that the person didn't commit the crime they were originally charged with. It's because we have to keep the system moving. And when we plea bargain a case, people lose their right to an appeal. That's something that they give up, which means a case is um, ending and victims have that resolution. They don't have to be thinking about this case is gonna get appealed over and over and over. So plea bargaining is a really, um, good way to resolve cases. Right, <clears throat> as a last minute thing this morning, I threw in these links. If you wanna watch court right now, what's really interesting is because of the pandemic, we're doing a lot of hearings online. So the top um, link is for felony cases. And if you click on that link, it'll tell you all the different things that you could log on and see. And then district court, same thing. Um, I would suggest that you watch what's called a preliminary appearance or a sentencing. If you're wanting to watch something really interesting, I think that's where you might be able to see people interacting, making arguments for bail, having victims speak. Okay, so some of our treatment courts that we have, we have quite a few special treatment courts. We have something called a veterans court. We have something called mental health court. We have drug court and DUI court. So for veterans court, that is a, um, a program that our county designed. I think we had the second one in the state for folks that are veterans and maybe having a little bit of rough time. They find themselves involved in the criminal justice system, but they don't really have much criminal history. Um, and we can see that there's something else going on here. It might be um, that they're having some problems related to their service that caused them to end up committing this crime. So we wanna honor that. We let them participate in a program that's usually about two years where they meet with counselors, they get connected with the veteran um, 
veteran services. And then if they're successful at the very end, their case is dismissed. So here's an example of a gentleman that graduated Veterans Court. This program is probably the one that's the most supported by the community. We have a group of ladies that make quilts and they will bring in a quilt um, and honor the veteran when they graduate um, Veterans Court and sort of wrap them in love with the, with the quilt. And so we try to take pictures of that. Um, this next slide is a gentleman who graduated Mental Health Court. Um, on the left is Judge Buckley. He's our presiding judge in district court and a veteran. On our right is John Thunheim. He's the elected prosecutor. So that's my boss. He almost never appears in court because um, he's pretty busy doing high level administrative things, but he so supports these therapeutic courts that he comes to every graduation and he gives a little speech about how proud he is of the person um, and hands them that little coin that, that the man is holding. And I think that's really important to, to see that I think a lot of people think of prosecutors as someone, you know, we just want to nail you, we want to send you away to jail, and we really don't. We want you to not commit crimes. We want you to come back into our community and get along with everybody. Um, we, we have plenty of cases. We don't need people to continue committing crimes, and we'd rather you get back in the community um, and not be involved in the criminal justice system. So our other program is, is drug court and DUI court. And that one is really intense with drug treatment. They help you finish school if you need to finish school, help you find a job. And again, at the end of that, if you're successful, then your case gets dismissed and you don't go to prison, usually for years and years and years. So those are some really great programs that we do that are non-traditional. Okay, now, I'd like to introduce Marshall, the courthouse facility dog. Marshall is one of my coworkers and he started working with us in, I think it was 2015, 2016. He came from Hawaii, so he hates the rain, poor guy. And he wears that little vest. When he's wearing that vest, he's working. Um, we have this sign up at the courthouse. I give hugs, I don't sniff for drugs. And Marshall's primary role is to provide support to the victims who need to testify or who are being interviewed or who need to be in court for some other reason. He's there to support them. But in reality, he's a support dog for all of us. So sometimes I've come back from court, had a rough day, and I just get down on the floor and get to play with Marshall. Um, and that's really rewarding. Um, he has to be walked. He has rights. So he has to be walked at a certain time every day and around the courthouse campus, people just stop him constantly, other county employees, and he's quite the celebrity. So here's Marshall giving support to a victim who came in to visit with us. And he is trained to do things like rest his head on your lap, that sort of thing. Here he is um, working with a child who's visiting in the courtroom prior to getting ready to testify. And she's petting him and seeing how while she's testifying, he'll lay his head on her lap. Okay, so how to become a prosecutor? The education that you need. Usually when I'm speaking to live students, I like to have you guess, and obviously we can't do that today. So first step is to graduate high school. So I'll talk a little bit about myself and what my journey was. So I already told you I graduated Yelm High School. Um, I'm a first generation college student, so none of my family had been to college before, and we weren't really sure how to pay for school or what that would look like. So I went to community college. I went to Pierce College first. I should have done Running Start, but we didn't even really know. We didn't really even know what that was about. It was a kind of a new program. It seemed weird to not go to high school. In retrospect, I should have done that because it would have saved my family a lot of money. So I went to community college, then I went up to University of Washington and I have a bachelor's degree. So I studied psychology in college. You can study anything you want and still go to law school. When I was in law school, we had people who were doctors, engineers, political science majors, music majors, all different kinds of people go to law school. When I was a senior in law school or in college, I took the LSAT, which is a test to help you figure out kind of like SAT, it's just a test that you take to help figure out what kind of school you can go to. I took that. Um, I ended up going to law school in Texas Tech, because, which is in Lubbock, Texas, 
I got a pretty good scholarship there. And again, I was really nervous about taking on student loans because that wasn't something my, familiar, my family was familiar with. So it was really important to me that I went to a school where I didn't have a very much debt when I graduated. So college was four years, law school was three years. I had to take the bar exam. I took the bar exam in Texas first. Coulter was born 10 days after I took the bar exam. So he, I like to say he took it with me. Um, I practiced in Texas for a year or two. And then um, we moved back to Washington and I had to take the bar exam in Washington state too. Most states now are moving to a, a test that is um, unified. So you can take one test and maybe get licensed in more than one state. But back then I had to get licensed in both states. Um, our pay is pretty good. It depends on what jurisdiction you're working in. So I think our starting prosecutors make about 63,000 a year starting out. Um, our senior prosecutors max out at 150,000. So on the one hand, 150,000, that seems like a lot of money, but on the other hand, for someone who's been practicing law for 15 or 20 years, it's not quite as much as you might make in the private sector. Um, but in Thurston County, um, the attorneys don't make a lot of money. The really high paid attorneys tend to be in the larger cities like Tacoma or Seattle. And so if you want to work in a smaller jurisdiction, um, then it's a pretty good um, job because we have very, very good benefits in retirement um, and a pretty predictable work schedule. The life work balance is pretty good. So I do work more than 40 hours a week. I work oftentimes in the evenings and the weekends. And like I said, sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, but if I'm not in trial, it's usually not a problem at all for me to leave work during the day. I get to do things like this, talk to students. Um, I've been able to make nearly all of my kids' school activities I could go to during the day um, with that, without there being any problem or any uh, negative effects at work. It's sort of up to me to balance my workload as long as I am um, meeting my obligations and in court when I need to be. Okay, so any questions? You guys can go ahead and just put those questions in. I've got just a couple minutes here. While, while we're coming up to those questions, though, I just want to acknowledge that because I think a lot of kids miss this sometimes. You started out at community college. And now you're successful yep. with a career, right? Like you don't have to go straight into that four-year university. Um, nope. I went to community college. Uh, I wanted to study psychology. And like I said, I was so naive. I did not understand that you needed a master's or a doctorate to do anything in psychology. And I really hated math. Um, and I thought the idea of taking statistics in grad school freaked me out. And I would rather go to law school, which is pretty funny. All right, we have two questions. So maybe just okay. some quick responses for both. The first one, is it a stressful job? Yes, it's definitely a stressful job. Um, it's an exciting job and it's very rewarding. Like I do absolutely love my job, but absolutely it is stressful. Thank you. And what can students do to, better be, uh, to be better prepared for success in that career? I think that if you really are interested in being a prosecutor or any other type of trial attorney, you should do mock trial. I know we don't have a program at Yelm High School. I keep thinking I'm gonna try and get one started and I don't, but you can do it in college. The mock trial is kind of like a club, like debate club where you um, pretend to be a lawyer and practice trying cases. There's also something called moot court, which is just arguing cases where you're not presenting evidence, you're just making appellate arguments. And that's a really good thing that helps you learn how to speak in front of other people and not be nervous. And then if you can't get into any of those programs, then I would suggest doing debate club because you learn how to formulate arguments and be able to see the other side's arguments. You've got to be able to understand your opponent's arguments or you cannot succeed as a trial attorney. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kaylin, for doing this today, uh, taking the time to share your career and some advice with us, answering a few questions at the end. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time. No problem. Thanks for having me.